Good afternoon. If I could have everybody's attention, we're going to get started with our program. Um, I'm Suzanne Schultz, the president of the Defense Forum Foundation, and it's my honor to welcome you to our Congressional Defense and Foreign Policy Forum. Um, I want to thank you for being here. I know everybody's got a very busy schedule, but I want to thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, to join us today. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to recognize Ty McCoy, our vice chair, who. Uh, those are people instrumental in making this forum today possible, and I also want to introduce um, a hero to the people of China. He's an inspiration to freedom fighters all over the world. He's a, one of my personal heroes as well, Dr. Yang Zheng Li, the president of China. Many of you know he's the president founder of Citizens Power Initiatives for China. He just got back from the Prague, right? Yeah. He rushed back here just so he could hear our speaker. Right. <laughs> so, so our speaker today, Dr. John Lachowski, is the founder and director of the Institute of World Politics, the only academic institution dedicated to teaching all the arts of statecraft, everything from <coughs> military strategy to economic strategy to moral leadership, and how to integrate these into a national strategy. In fact, he was the first person who coined the term full spectrum diplomacy which is an integrated strategy that encompasses all the instruments of engagement, including both traditional uh, diplomacy and public diplomacy, as well as cultural diplomacy, which is enhanced contact with people at the grassroots level. It's very near and dear to my heart, because many of you know we're affiliated with the North Korea Radio, which is reaching the grassroots of people in North Korea. But I want to tell you a little bit about what he was doing before he founded the Institute of World Politics. Back in the 1980s, he served as the US State Department, at the US State Department as the special advisor to the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs when he was involved in making sure that Radio <coughs> Europe and Radio Liberty had the necessary support to disseminate news rapidly and overcome the jamming attempts of the Soviet Union. He was able to get Congress to authorize $2.5 billion to modernize, to modernize DOA and Radio for Europe. After that, he became involved in the Active Measures Working Group, aimed at countering Soviet disinformation, and following that, he then served as Director of European and Soviet Affairs at the National Security Council, where he was the principal advisor to President Ronald Reagan. In that role, he helped develop the very policies that helped collapse the Soviet Empire. So as one of the individuals who helped the U.S. win the Cold War, against the Soviet Union, it's most appropriate to have Dr. Wachowski address the topic U.S. strategy for the growing of China threat. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Suzanne, for uh, that very nice introduction. You really did some homework uh, about my background. Very grateful uh, that you did. Uh, I want to thank you for your own heroic efforts for the cause of freedom and the security of this country, uh, the cause of uh, oppressed people uh, around the world, particularly in North Korea and China. Uh, you have been one of the stalwarts uh, for the cause of our national security for many years, and I'm honored to have this podium. Your leadership. I'd also like to thank Ty McCoy for his support of uh, the Defense Forum Foundation. And uh, it happens that Ty is a member of the Board of Trustees and Executive Committee of the Institute of World Politics. Uh, he has been uh, a wonderful supporter of our effort. And so I, I want to thank Ty for his extraordinary service to this country and multiple theaters. So today, I'd like to um, I'd like to talk about how to develop an integrated strategy to deal with China. But perhaps in order to be, before I start talking about what we must do, I would like briefly, as briefly as I possibly can, to to, to discuss the full extent of the Chinese threat to the United States and to the free world. Uh, China has been conducting a cold war against the United States for many years, and maybe you could say many decades. Uh, 
We, however, uh, have so many impediments to our ability to perceive this reality. Uh, we have utopian ideas about how China is going to uh, transform itself internally. We are filled with wishful thinking, willful blindness, uh, what Solzhenitsyn called the desire not to know. We don't want to face the realities that are happening under our noses. Uh, and then, of course, there are lots of people who already have been getting very good lessons in how to censor themselves the way one has to do to live under a totalitarian system. And we see our businesses censoring themselves, uh, our, whether it's people in the NBA or in our hotel chains or our airlines and everybody else. It's a pathetic, if not disgusting, sight uh, for those of us who believe that when you live in America, you still ought to be able to have the courage to tell some truth, that it's becoming less capable, less possible to do that even in our own country when our universities are amongst the greatest enemies of freedom of speech. And we've got political correctness run rampant in our country. Let me review some of the Cold War actions that China has been taking against us. First of all, there is the massive espionage against our country. Truly massive. Uh, it, there are something, there are at least 50,000 Chinese intelligence collectors in this country. There could be double that, for all we know. I don't think U.S. counterintelligence could possibly give us a good estimate. All I know is that whenever I talk with our counterintelligence authorities, and every time I toss out 10,000, 25,000, something like that, I'm told that I'm severely underestimating it, and so 50,000 seems like a more accurate type of a figure. We, there are at over 350,000 Chinese students in this country, there are 3,000, 300,000 Chinese researchers. The Chinese make 5,000 visits a year to our national laboratories where a visit constitutes a stay of two weeks to two years. We let them do this. We hand over our technology for, well, of course, we, we don't just uh, let them steal things. We actually give it to them. And for something like three to four decades, we, uh, we were covertly and deliberately assisting China in the development of something like 10,000 different technologies. The United States has deliberately built China into a superpower and into a moral threat to our own existence. And, and we have done so uh, on the basis of what I consider to have been, and even at the time, a very ill-advised policy of trying to play 19th century balance of power politics by pitting China against the Soviet Union, and which ended up creating what I consider to be a gross moral strategic confusion, which made the, 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 the Soviets into the bad communists, and by implication, the Chinese into good communists. The, um, the Obama administration gave 10-year visas to 2 million Chinese. Uh, there are Chinese who uh, are coming to our country, and, 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 bear, and the Chinese women who are burying their children here so that there can be more uh, American citizens but then they go back to China. The Chinese are conducting enormous uh, data collection on Americans. Uh, of course, we know about 21 million background files that were stolen of, of people from uh, security clearances from the Office of Personnel Management. We know that 78 million medical records were hacked and stolen from the Anthem uh, medical system. Uh, one of the major companies collecting DNA uh, and, and telling you whether you have uh, uh, some, some Neanderthal uh, ancestors is owned by the Chinese and they're collecting our DNA. They're engaging in uh, uh, massive military buildup, space weapons. One can argue that they are ahead of us in the weaponization of space. In 2007, they conducted a laser test against U.S. satellites to demonstrate their capacity to blind them. They have uh, uh, direct ascent kinetic anti-satellite weapons. We have no defenses against these things. 
they have a massive naval buildup, and as our as our ships start uh, 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 aging uh, and, and 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 our fleet starts uh, shrinking uh, or continues to shrink, uh, the Chinese naval buildup continues apace uh, at, at, at a very fast pace. The Chinese have built the underground Great Wall, which is a collection of tunnels. Uh, uh, steel concrete reinforced tunnels through which you can drive a truck, behind which is dragged a road mobile ICBM launchers with nuclear weapons. How big is this collection of, uh, uh, of, tu of tunnels? The best estimate to date is something like 3,000 miles of tunnels. People don't know about this unless they, 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 they basically because our major media don't report this. Uh, the Chinese have developed a neutron bomb, they've developed hypersonic weapons, they've developed a capacity to send an electromagnetic pulse that can wipe out our entire electrical, our electrical grid. We have not hardened it to the extent of this. We've barely hardened it at all. And another, there's so much more that can be said about the military, uh, but those are just a few highlights. Then there are their influence operations and their propaganda. China has a massive propaganda operation from going on around the world. They have something like 3,000 radio stations, 2,500 television stations. They, they control thousands of newspapers, at least six English language newspapers. They are broadcasting inside this country, both from within this country and from Mexico. They, have, um, they, they are corrupting our media. We all, we, we all know about the traditional techniques about reporting from totalitarian countries. In the Soviet Union, it was the case, and it is the same thing in China, where our journalists will not write about what I call the four taboos. What are the four taboos? Don't write about the Chinese military, don't write about their espionage, don't write about their active measures, propaganda, and covert influence operations, and don't write about their human rights violations. And if you censor yourself about all of those things, you won't do anything too offensive to the mandarins of Beijing, and they will, and, and they might let you along uh, to to, uh, to report things that are much more ordinary. American scholars, by the way, censor themselves about these things because if they write about any of the four taboos in a way that proves crosses the the, the threshold of what is offensive to Beijing, they will. Uh, uh, they won't get a visa to China, and so, so the, the, both the journalists and the scholars are subject to the uh, to visa restrictions uh, and uh, access uh, restrictions in, in, in any number of different ways. So uh, the best reporters, of course, um, will obviously have to censor themselves if they don't want their bureau to close down in, in Beijing. Uh, but they will, uh, the best ones will then come back and perhaps write a book about the subject and write a few facts that they couldn't report on the front pages of uh, the New York Times and the Washington Post. And speaking of those two newspapers, the two most influential papers in the United States, both of them are taking millions of dollars in, uh, from, the, from Beijing's propaganda ministry uh, to publish the periodic China Watch supplement, which is good old-fashioned communist propaganda. To what extent do this, does the China Watch supplement influence people? I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I think it must have some kind of an effect. Uh, but what it really does is it, it uh, exploits the, uh, the, the media's power to ignore, and, and it basically bribes them into living according to the four taboos. And so the other major media, the television stations, take the lead from the New York Times and the Washington Post. And if you want to learn anything about some, you know, some of these matters amongst the four taboo subjects, you have to read the Washington Times, maybe the Epoch Times. You have to read other sources of media that still have, uh, that, 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 that are, are, are not corrupted by Beijing. <laughs> Beijing is corrupting our academic institutions, 107 Confucius institutes that are propaganda centers that are designed to chill criticism of, of Beijing's policies in, uh, uh, on, on American university campuses. Uh, they, are, they are controlled by the Chinese. They are subject to Chinese communist speech codes. 
We have 20 American cultural centers in China. They are controlled by the Chinese and not by us. The, uh, the Chinese are giving lots of money to American universities. They give $250 million to Harvard, millions to Stanford. They give money and, 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 and engage in joint projects with the Atlantic Council, with the, with the Center for Strategic and International Studies, with the, the, uh, with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, with the Carter Center, with the, uh, I'm, I'm not, the Brookings Institution. Uh, I can, there are more and more and more of them. Uh, my own alma mater, Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, has taken money from one of the front organizations of Chinese intelligence. Uh, and so uh, this is all corruption. It is all corruption. It is, a, it is intolerable in a free society. Nobody seems to say very much about it. China is busy trying to corrupt our politicians. Uh, they make campaign contributions. Some of them have been enormous, uh, going all the way back, uh, well documented at least, into the 1990s. They target congressional staffers. They, uh, they target the families of our politicians. They like to enrich the relatives of some of our prominent politicians. You can read a little bit about this in the newspapers. They, uh, they, uh, they target state and local politicians because they know that the councilman might become a state senator and the state senator may become a, a, a U.S. congressman. And they, it is the so-called rising tide strategy. The, the Chinese are, of course, are busy influencing our business community. The, the political neutralization of the American business community is one of the most dramatic and most strategically significant phenomena that we've ever seen in any Cold War type behavior uh, over the course of the last century. Uh, Lenin, Stalin, Brezhnev, uh, Andropov, Gorbachev, all of them, well, Gorbachev's still alive, but the rest of them must be all lying there green with envy in their graves as they look at the success of what China has done to politically neutralize our business community. And the result of this is that, that, uh, that uh, all sorts of business leaders who are making lots and lots and lots of money with China, doing business with China, are on the boards of our universities, <coughs> on the boards of our think tanks, and as a result, some of them are censoring the activities that are going on in our think tanks. Uh, in one particular example, famous think tank here in town you've all heard of, a military analyst was working there. He, uh, he was writing things dispassionately, clinically, factually, no, no, no demagogy in, in his analysis. A major business leader with huge China uh, business interests uh, started getting worried about this guy's analysis because he thought that if uh, more Americans were started getting worried about the Chinese military buildup, that that might be the source of U.S.-China tensions. And so uh, he decided that if there were more U.S.-China tensions, that would rock the boat and adversely affect his business interests. He arranged to have that guy fired and, uh, and given a big dollop of hush money. And he was fired. He went to another think tank where two trustees who were major financial <coughs> contributors to that think tank, uh, uh, threatened to resign and withhold their financial support if this guy was not removed. He was removed. I can tell you more stories about this, including one of, a, in one of our own professors uh, who used to work at a, at, a, at a major think tank. He started protesting publicly about how so many former cabinet members, secretaries of state, secretaries of defense, and directors of central intelligence retired were directly or indirectly on Beijing's payroll. Uh, and, uh, and, and yet they were coming up here to buildings like this, to rooms nearby, and testifying as elder statesmen uh, uh, according to, you know, apparently uh, in the interest of the United States, and uh, with the result being that without, without revealing their conflict of interest, it almost always downplaying the China threat. That's the main theme. Downplay the China threat and encourage people to believe that, uh, that, that, that they're going to uh, uh, 
reform themselves internally and become a democracy. Um, well, it happens that one of those cabinet members was on the board of this think tank, and he uh, engineered that this panelist be fired. We ended up hiring him at the Institute of World Politics. Um, this is distressing. Uh, China invests in selected uh, and targeted uh, congressional districts precisely and to, tries to do joint ventures and the, with the result being that if there is some uh, you know, threat to Chinese interests, uh, well that threat uh, would also be something shared by the American workforce in that, in that company. And so we've recently seen one of our prominent congressional leaders uh, in this House of Congress uh, step forth step forward uh, in defense of, uh, of a U.S.-Chinese joint venture uh, in, in his congressional district in a way that was contrary to the national interests of the United States. Um, the Chinese are engaged in active measures. Active measures is an old KGB term of art that refers to disinformation, forgeries, and covert political influence operations, provocations, diversions, black propaganda, um, all sorts of propaganda of the deed, uh, which includes terrorism, and so on and so forth. They have their United Front Work Department working on this kind of thing. It is a massive operation. Xi Jinping added 14,000 new personnel to the United Front Work Department, on top of the tens of thousands who were working there already. And I haven't been able to come up with the exact number of of what that original, but it's a very large number of people. These active measures <coughs> use uh, are a, 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 a huge variety. I can't go into all of the details today, but suffice it to say that the, the, the companies are using social media uh, as part of uh, and, and, and a lot of the kinds of techniques that you've seen the Russians doing. Their, their efforts are just as big as the Russian efforts, which were documented fairly well in the Mueller report. Um, but uh, nobody seems to think or, or care much about the Chinese operations. The Chinese uh, have been penetrating the, uh, the Chinese-American or the Chinese diaspora communities around the world and in this country have been attempting to take over um, the, the, and influence the Chinese-American media. They attempt to silence dissidents who find their asylum here in the United States. The Chinese are influencing <coughs> Hollywood. They restrict the number of, of, uh, uh, of they restrict the number of uh, movies that can be uh, uh, that, that can be uh, distributed in, in, inside China, and they get basically the Hollywood producers to censor themselves to to shape uh, the movies. Uh, including those that are only shown in the United States in ways that are not offensive to China. A huge issue. They own the entire, China owns the entire AMC uh, theater chain. Then they've got their economic strategy. It is a strategy that is characterized, in short, by a total lack of reciprocity. It is not free trade. It is mercantilistic, beggar thy neighbor, uh, uh, protectionist, uh, trade strategies that are designed to to, uh, to to undermine American corporations, that are designed to uh, increase, to, to put them out of business, and, and to take over their market share in the United States. They buy American companies, they have joint ventures with American companies, they finance American high-tech companies, they use American capital markets to get access to fund their, uh, their own business and their military buildup. They are now, right now, and they're, apparently there's some kind of effort, I don't know exactly the details of this, where some rules might change here in the United States that will enable our federal pension funds and, and military pension funds to, uh, to move from a 5% uh, a level of investment in Chinese companies to a something like a 20 or 25 percent level. This should be stopped. Uh, maybe there's one person in this room who's capable of doing something about it. The, the Chinese, of course, put conditions upon entry into the China market. Uh, you've got to turn over your, 
your technology, you've got to bring your R&D into China. They don't let you have access to all their, their billion plus consumers. They're producing counterfeit goods. Uh, they, of course, they use all of this stolen technology. And frankly, uh, I think we need to, to start using uh, some better semantics about all of this. When one is buying a Chinese product, oftentimes one is buying de facto stolen goods. And I don't think it is honorable, moral, and perhaps it even shouldn't be legal to buy stolen goods. They are buying many of our best and our brightest and bringing them into their big talents campaign. <coughs> they have their personnel well embedded into the, into the most important uh, accounting firms in this country. And those accounting firms see the inside books of, uh, of, of, our, of many of our major businesses. And, and so uh, Chinese intelligence basically has an inside track to insider information that enables them to participate in stock market transactions that should be illegal, but because they have the advantage of foreign intelligence services helping them, so they can conceal all of this in ways that the SEC and the other enforcers cannot, uh, uh, cannot cope with. The Chinese have been engaged in cyber interference with U.S. corporate transactions. They've been able to hack into uh, the, 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 the servers where product orders are placed. There they've been able to sabotage the success of burgeoning high-tech companies. And then when the company starts teetering on the brink, they'll come in and buy it for pennies on the dollar. They, they have an entire uh, economic warfare strategy that Includes such maneuvers as naked short selling, which is illegal, which has been detected in the past, particularly during the 2008 financial crisis, where both China and some Middle East uh, sovereign wealth funds were involved in naked short selling uh, uh, all through a, a rather obscure brokerage, fund, brokerage firm in Texas. Uh, this is illegal, uh, but we don't seem to pay a, a, a lot of attention to it because economic warfare is, uh, is just doesn't seem to be uh, something that, that the U.S. government cares that much about. Uh, then there's the 5G threat. And, and I, don't, I, I, I can't even begin to describe the, 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 the scope of the vulnerability of our country and the entire free world if China succeeds in making a monopoly of 5G. They will have the capability of weaponizing the technology in, in every uh, in, in every uh, every connected and unsecured technology uh, can be weaponized under 5G. They have a global political strategy. You all know about the Belt and Road Initiative, a neo-colonial effort that involves the co-optation of the political elites of one country around the world. They've had for years a global strategy of, of a demographic and infrastructural presence at every major strategic naval choke point in the world, in, in, at the Strait of Malacca, the Strait of Hormuz, they're at the Strait of Bad, Bad, Bad al Mandeb with their new base in Djibouti, they've been at the Suez Canal, they are in the Dardanelles, they are on both sides of the, of, of the Panama Canal. I don't know about Gibraltar, if anybody uh, hears about a Chinese presence in Gibraltar, please let me know, and I can add that to the list. The, then there are miscellaneous acts of aggression. The fentanyl uh, uh, plague in this country is not an accident. The Chinese have been involved in narcotics warfare. As a matter of fact, the entire Soviet program of, of called Druzhba Narodov, the Friendship of the Peoples, was a program developed by Nikita Khrushchev in the 1950s to get the, not the KGB and the GRU, but to get the satellite intelligence services in the Soviet Empire to push narcotics on the West, to pickle the brains of American youth, to earn lots of money, so much money that they funded the entire intelligence services of the satellite countries with illegal narcotics money, um, and, and to gain dossiers on corrupt politicians in countries around the world so that they could be manipulated for intelligence purposes. Nikita Khrushchev, how did he do all this? He was inspired by the Chinese use of narcotics as a weapon of war during the Korean War.
Korean War. And he was so effective, he wanted to replicate it for, for the Soviet cause in the Cold War. The, uh, uh, about 15 years ago or something, I can't remember the date exactly, one of our students at the Institute of World Politics who was with an intelligence unit of US Customs told us at the Institute of World Politics about how uh, US Customs had just caught uh, uh, Chinese trying to export uh, uh, AK-47s to Los Angeles street gangs. Uh, uh, of course, so many of the threats that we face are a result of the result of self-inflicted uh, vulnerabilities. We have an incredible dependence upon China for our prescription drugs and other vital supply chain. So, what to do? What to do? Well, I think the number one thing to do is to tell the truth. Uh, I think that we haven't been telling ourselves the truth for way, way too long. And we are incredibly vulnerable as a result of this. This president, whatever you may think about him, his character, his policies, or whatever, is the first president to come along in many administrations to tell some of, of the real truth about the threat of China. And I think that uh, much more could still be done by the administration. The next thing. We have to erect defenses. And I think one of the first defenses that we have to do is a massive new focus on counterintelligence. Counter we are weak as a nation in counterintelligence. We've been weak for many years. There are lots of reasons for this. We at the Institute of World Politics study this very carefully. Those of you who are interested in this business should come and be our students. We have the first master's degree in intelligence, in strategic intelligence studies in the nation outside the US government, and we have the most serious counterintelligence program in the nation. And uh, all I can say is that this litany of, 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 uh, of uh, intelligence assaults against our country has to be stopped. And we need to put more uh, intellect behind it and more manpower behind it. And, and the intellect requires a lot of different things. But there are some very basic things. We've got to start restricting access. During the Cold War, we did not let the Soviets travel any more than 25 miles outside of the national capital area, New York, and their presence in the UN, and wherever they had a consulate, like in San Francisco, for example. Uh, the Chinese have the total run of this country. And, and it, this, this cannot be the case. We don't have the run of China. There needs to be reciprocity. Reciprocity is the key word. If any single word should be taken out of this, it should be a recognition that reciprocity in relations with China starts, needs to be implemented. And the reciprocity will, if, if we actually did it, and we never really did it with the Soviets, the Soviets had more KGB agents in the U.S. Embassy in Moscow than there were Americans working in the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. This is, you know, one can scarcely imagine a more epic manifestation of naivete, foolishness, and imprudence. But that's, you know, you know, we like to give other people the benefit of the doubt. When there's no doubt, it's pathological. It's insane. But that's the way we are. And, uh, and, and we've got to grow up and recognize that we are going to not to have a country anymore uh, if it goes at the, at the same pace it's been going for the last two decades. We need to restrict visas. When it comes to official, uh, official correspondence, China gives us two visas for Voice of America correspondence in, in, in Beijing, they will not give us a third one for, some, for, a, for a VOA correspondent in, in Shanghai. We give them 860 official visas to come to this country. Uh, the, the visas for just about everything. We should restrict access to our national laboratories, to our universities, to our corporate research facilities. I, I met a guy just, uh, just a few weeks ago who, who got his degree, engineering degree, here at the University of Maryland in the engineering school. He said the place was replete with Chinese uh, engineering students. 
And they already had their engineering degrees before they started to study for a new identical degree at the University of Maryland. Why do they need that degree already? So that they know what the so that they know what the cutting edge research is of the engineering professors in that school. So that they know what to steal and don't waste their time. Uh, so they come very well prepared. We need this needs to be restricted. We need to restrict the travel of Chinese putative immigrants who are living in this country and working in sensitive industries. I know of uh, a couple of people who work on software development for communications amidst of, uh, of our armed forces on the battlefield for secure communications. And they go back to China every year. They're working in classified activities, and we let them go back to China every year. What do you think they do in China? They get, they, they get debriefed by the MSS. I mean, it's, it's breathtaking. We have to prohibit American lawyers from teaching Chinese spies how to circumvent our export controls and circumvent our technology security measures. American lawyers do this, and they get paid a lot of money to teach Chinese spies how to circumvent our, our technology security. We need a national campaign of public service announcements to enhance cyber threat awareness, which is still pathetic. We need to conduct offensive <coughs> counterintelligence operations, which means doing things like doctoring the blueprints uh, and, 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 and the, the technology plans for the develop, de development of high technology so that when the Chinese steal them, and they try to put them together, they will have a very bad day. Uh, we need to restore our armed forces. Where does one begin? One of our problems is that we have undertaken what the German Nazis did. They always had the highest, highest quality weapons with every bell and whistle. But the American strategy during World War II was to have very good quality things. Maybe not every bell and whistle on every aircraft and ship and tank and so on and so forth, but massive quantitative uh, superiority. And uh, I think that we need to add a much greater quantity to our Navy, to our Air Force, and other things. We need to develop space weapons. We need to develop defenses for our satellites. We need to develop defenses for hypersonic missiles. We need to harden our electric grid, which is something in national strategic terms which is extremely cheap. We need to develop aircraft with much longer range for our aircraft carriers that are incredibly vulnerable when they are stationed too close to Chinese anti-ship missiles. We need to restore our defense industrial base and avoid dependence upon foreign parts. We need to strengthen our alliances, especially in East Asia. We need to stand by Taiwan. We need to make sure that Taiwan gets serious arms. We need to stand by the Philippines and make sure that China doesn't walk all over it in, in its, in, in its uh, combat, international legal combat with China over uh, some of these uh, little rocky outcroppings. <laughs> We, uh, I think we need to seriously think about permitting South Korea to develop a, a just below the threshold of nuclear capability so that if, uh, if all of a sudden it seemed necessary, South Korea could have a capability within, say, six months or something like that. Um, Japan, too. I think Japan already has. Um, I think we need to restore COCOM. COCOM, C-O-C-O-M, the, Co the Coordinating Committee on Multilateral uh, Export Controls. This was a, an alliance-wide, NATO-wide, but we included Japan in it, uh, effort to try to make sure that one ally does not undercut another ally 
by selling technologies to the Soviet bloc. Uh, and it was a remarkably successful effort. It required a lot of, of, of serious cooperative diplomacy. We need to implement a global information campaign to inform the world about Chinese methods. China and its Belt and Road Initiative is something that is, uh, is, is they have an element of surprise uh, in, in their activities with all sorts of countries around the world. These countries need to be informed about it. Uh, China does not deserve the reputation that it has in many parts of the world. And it is very serious about its cultural diplomacy, its, its own information and propaganda operations. Uh, we need to warn the rest of the world before it's too late. Uh, we need to develop uh, our own economic strategy. And this has to be a strategy of reciprocity. Uh, this means, in my view, de facto gradual disengagement of between the two economies. Uh, China is not going to change its habits. It's going to keep doing what it's doing because of its DNA. You know, there are two different types of animals in the forest. There are carnivores and there are herbivores. And you know, you're just not going to change a, herb, a carnivore from wanting to eat herbivores. You're just you're not going to change that. And it is in the nature of the Chinese regime to behave the way it does. And we have to finally come to that realization. We have to enforce our securities laws. Our, we have to enforce transparency in all the different kinds of commercial relations that we have with the Chinese. We don't do a good job at this. And this is a huge field about which others have written. Most recently, uh, uh, Rob, General Rob Spaulding has his new book on stealth war, uh, to which I commend your attention. Uh, brilliant. Uh, brilliant analysis by a, a, a great uh, American patriot and who has served this country in so many different uh, excellent ways. We need to encourage alternative sources of supply uh, from, from other countries and from within our own country. We have to decrease our dependency on China and tariffs, however harmful they can be, and I acknowledge they can be. There is no alternative to it. They are necessary and they are effective if they are to restore reciprocity in commercial relations. Then there are positive things we can do. There is the whole idea of the Pacific Charter. Paul Berkowitz, a longtime House Foreign Affairs Committee staff member uh, uh, who's in this room here, and Paul, I salute you for the work that you've done in this field for many years. Uh, when he worked for Congressman Ben Gilman, the chairman of the committee, um, they, uh, the, the Congress passed legislation uh, to set up a commission on, on the whole subject of a Pacific Charter, which is a kind of a new version of the Atlantic Charter, about which I hope you know. If you don't, please look it up. Uh, the, the, uh, the Pacific Charter is basically the, uh, an idea of of the United States working with our allies to promote democracy in the, in the Asia Pacific region, the rule of law, human rights, and re regional economic cooperation, and to enhance the credibility of US leadership in the region. I think that we have to stand up for our principles. We still do represent these great ideas. And as much as Americans are at each other's throats, in domestic politics, I think we still do believe in the rule of law. We still do believe in inalienable rights and the dignity of the individual human person. All things that, that are completely at odds with the Chinese business, uh, the Chinese regime. Now the last thing I want to say here, I think is maybe amongst the most important, if we really want to win the Cold War with China. And that is, we have to start conducting Cold War policies too, not just defense. We need to have offense. We need to restore reciprocity in this. And offense means, in, in war, it means attacking the enemy's center of gravity. What is the center of gravity in China, and North Korea for that matter? The center of gravity 
is that without which the enemy cannot make war. That without which the enemy cannot survive. And in China and in North Korea and in regimes like this, the center of gravity is the internal security system of the state. The central fact of political life in China and North Korea and totalitarian regimes like this is the, the illegitimacy of the regime. The regime rules without the consent of the government. And when you are an illegitimate regime, you have a massive internal security problem. You are afraid of your own people. That is the central fact of political life. And you are afraid of anything that can excite your people to resist you and maybe even overthrow you. And that is why China fears the truth, why it has to control all information and communications, why it jams foreign broadcasts, why it will, will forbid the free flow of information. And, and of course, you know, the internal security system, you know, your system of informants, the Lao Gai, the, the Gulag Archipelago of China, uh, about which nobody knows because the New York Times and the Washington Post never word, never print the word Lao Gai on their pages. You should know what it is. Lao Gai is the Gulag Archipelago of China. Slave labor, punishment of prisoners of conscience fallen gone practitioners, Christians, Muslims, political dissidents. This is all, China is one massive human rights violating machine. And it does this because it is afraid of its own people. So, you know, one of the soundest principles of strategy is that you have to know who your allies are. And in my view, our greatest allies in all of this, our potential allies, are the Chinese people. The people whose human rights are being violated, who are not part of the privileged nomenclatura class of, of big shots who are getting rich and having the protections of the, of the party. These are our allies. And there are something like 70,000 plus civil disturbances every year in China. that are demonstrations, riots, uh, whatever kind of disturbances, protesting usually local Communist Party corruption. Do they know about the existence of the other disturbances? They don't. Because the way communist regimes work is when there is a civil disturbance in some given region, the regime cuts off all communications to that locality. And only then, when the communications are cut off, do they go in and crush the thing physically. So that if other people ever end, end up learning that there was a demonstration, or a strike, or a riot, or something like that, they are the, the, the message really is that it was crushed. And therefore, it's futile to even try to do something like that again. The entire psychological strategy of the internal security system of the Chinese Communist state is to get the people into a state of futile resignation. To get people to believe that resistance against this regime is futile. And once they can be enough, part of all of this involves the atomization of society. What's that? It's where you separate every single individual from everybody else. The individual stands alone against the all-powerful party state. And how is this done? It's done by a pervasive system of secret informants. I don't know how many secret informants there are in China, but in East Germany, the Germans kept some good statistics. It was a full 30% of the population. 30%. That means somebody in your family was an informant, but you didn't know it. He couldn't tell you, and they would test you. He may not have wanted to be an informant. He may have been forced to be an informant, and they would test him 
to see if he would inform by committing an economic crime or something else in front of his nose. And then, if he doesn't inform, then he gets punished. A pervasive atmosphere of mistrust. You can't even trust people when it really gets bad, even in your own family. So, then there's the, there's the ideology, which is the drum beating for the soldiers marching. It sets the standard against which deviationism is measured. It is the standard of conformity. It is political correctness. That's what political correctness is. And everybody has to march according to that drum. And if you don't, you can be identified by the sergeant and taken out of the formation and discipline. So, this is all bolstered and all kept together by this monopoly of information and communication. Our strategic task is to break that monopoly. And that means helping the Chinese people communicate with themselves, communicating with them on a mass scale. That's why when Suzanne introduced me and talked about Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, this was the strategy that we used. We did a lot of things in the material sphere. We denied China, we denied the Soviets our currency, we denied the technology, we, we did counterintelligence operations, we did our military buildup, we put pressure on them, we developed SDI. It was a punitive uh, trumping of their first strike capability of their just their SS-18 force alone. We did all these things. We helped the anti-communist resistance in Afghanistan, in Southern Africa, and in Central America. But none of those, those are all material things, basically. And, and none of those material things explain how a million people took to the streets in Moscow when they darn well knew that by taking to the streets, they could be arrested, tortured, thrown into the gulag. And yet, they had the courage to do that. It was our public diplomacy that helped give them that courage. We communicated with them. We sympathized with them. We stood up for their human rights. You people who are oppressed under this regime are not alone. We're, we, we're not going to send our armies in there, but we're behind you. And we think that change is possible, but the decision of what to do is in your hands. The decision of what to do in Hong Kong is in the people of Hong Kong's hands. And what we're seeing now is absolutely a magnificent display of public resistance to the totalitarian regime. I, I don't know how they're going to handle it. But don't underestimate the power of the gun. We need to start broadcasting in a very big way, many more hours a day, many more frequencies. We've been giving up our frequencies. We have been shutting down many of our major broadcasting services in, in the Voice of America. Uh, the last administration tried to shut down the Mandarin and the Cantonese services. If it weren't for a few heroic people coming out of the VOA to, and, uh, to, to try to save this, it, it, would be, it would be shut down. All in favor of the internet. But there are more internet police in China than there are members of the People's Liberation Army. You cannot surf the internet anonymously. You can listen <coughs> anonymously. But then there are new technologies. There is DRM. DRM. Digital Radio Mondial. Digital Radio Mondial. You can broadcast. This is the harnessing of the digital revolution to international, to shortwave radio broadcasting. And by the way, this cannot be. It's not just shortwave, not just TV, not just not just internet. Every one of this, this offensive against the center of gravity, has to be multimedia. Every medium you can get. In North Korea, they put little USB sticks in a bottle, and the bottle has a bunch of rice in it, and they throw these bottles in the river, and they go down the river, and the starving North Koreans find the bottle, they have some rice, and they've got an alternative information source. Every method possible. 
We used to bring in fax machines. We brought in copying machines. We brought in mimeograph machines. Most people don't even know what a mimeograph machine is. It's what it's how they made our tests when I was in elementary school. You you put something in there and you turn this the crank. It's a mechanical machine that, uh, that, that, that 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 produces copies without having a you know photocopier. And we we sent in scores of a mimeograph machines behind the iron curtain, and we sent in paper because the regime had a monopoly of paper. And in the Soviet Union, there was an armed guard by every photocopying machine. So every method, multimedia, DRM is one way. And by the way, DRM will not only send voice, it will send text. It can even send video, but I've been told by certain technical experts that, that as a practical matter, we don't have the bandwidth for, doing, for sending video. But you can look at it anonymous. Well, you need to have DRM receivers. Well, let's make DRM receivers. They're a lot cheaper than fighter aircraft. And you can make millions of them, and you can flood the world. And then there are broadcast satellites, and there are apparently some new kinds that are tiny little battery-sized satellites that can broadcast, and you can put thousands of them in the sky and broadcast directly below to totalitarian regimes. We need to have a full court press in information warfare because they're doing it. They're doing it against us. They're shaping our perceptions. They're controlling our discourse. They're causing us to censor ourselves. We are losing our freedom in the process, and we're doing nothing in return. That is at, 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 the, at a truly national strategic level. We have to stop being so materialistic as a foreign policy culture. The Russians understand this, the Chinese understand this, the, Chinese, the, the Russians say that victory in information warfare can be more powerful than a classic military victory. That comes from the chief of the, of the Russian general staff. The chief of the Russian general staff, kinetic warrior, is saying that information war is the thing that can make a more devastating victory. Anyway, I could talk for a little while longer, but I think I've seen it. Intel analyst and a former diplomat. I note that we began a campaign somewhere around 1950 against the Soviet Union and ultimately it succeeded. I see zero indication that we've begun the China campaign now. My problem with that is you can pay a lot now, or you can pay a hell of a lot later. So it seems when you know the cancer is going to spread and it will never get better, that you should be making investment now. So where's the secret committee on the NSC? that is arranging the campaign that you outlined. I don't see it. I don't see it yet either, although I think there are individuals in the administration who understand this. General Spaulding sure did. And uh, you know, he organized seminars. He invited me to come and speak at one of them on the whole subject of winning without war. And by the way, that's a little slogan that we have at the Institute of World Politics. You know, we teach all of these instruments of statecraft, all these instruments of national power. And uh, you know, we happen to believe that if you use the non-military ones effectively, you don't have to start killing people to defend your interests. Uh, and, and, and so there is resonance. Uh, there is an indication of some of this kind of thing in the national security strategy of the United States. And uh, you know, a couple of us at IWD were privileged to be invited to consult on that. Um, I think that there has been uh, understanding of some of this in the Department of State. Uh, I believe that there are, uh, unfortunately, there has been you know, there's been a lot of personnel turnover in this administration in these foreign policy jobs, and uh, I think that's regrettable. Uh, it is what it is, but there are still people in the government who understand this. 
The question is, are we going to, to actually do some serious strategic organizing of all this? And this requires integrated strategy. This requires something indeed out of the NSC. I think that the I think the State Department is an essential part of it. I think that if the State Department can get behind it, it will be easy to get the Pentagon. I think the Pentagon is uh, uh, understands this as well as anybody does. But uh, but the Pentagon has limits as to what it can do in these in, in economic warfare, in information warfare, uh, in cultural warfare, ideological warfare. I, mean, you know, I, I didn't even get into uh, culture and ideology, but those are all part of it. Uh, and and, and, and uh, fighting a war of ideas. You know, which agency of the U.S. government hires warriors of ideas? You know, we, George Bush said that we are in a war with radical Islamism. Um, the, uh, you know, the war of ideas with radical Islamism. But there's no, no ideological warriors in this war. Maybe there are a couple at DOA and at uh, the Middle East Broadcast Network and stuff like that, but maybe there are a couple of people in the uh, National Clandestine Service uh, Covert Operations Unit. But uh, they don't do all that much. Uh, this kind of thing. Uh, they, don't, they don't specialize in hiring people who do this. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, those of us who are conscious of this level of threat need to talk this up, need to encourage people to do something about it. Uh, I, have, uh, I have briefed some top, uh, some top officials in the State Department about some of this. I think there are people at the Global Engagement Center uh, who understand this. I think Assistant Secretary for Human Rights understands this. I think there are people inside Secretary Pompeo's office who understand it. The problem is, in the State Department, as you must know, uh, the urgent always crowds out the strategic. You know, you've got something going on in Syria, you've got something going on in wherever, uh, and all of a sudden you've got to deal with it. That's, this, that's a traditional problem in every business, every organization. But this is one of these situations where we truly need serious national strategy. Well, I don't know what better to say. You know. Yes, Paul. It, John, you listed um, 25 things they're doing to us and 25 things we need to do them. And I don't know if that's done on purpose or what. Providential. <laughs> providential. It's providential. It's <laughs> but um, I just, one thing you didn't mention was that we need the clean house. We've got politicians, we've got people in think tanks, we've got people in GOD who were on the wrong side of this years ago, and now they're, all of a sudden they've woken up. And for whatever reason they were on the wrong, the wrong side, cowardice, or they weren't smart enough, I'm glad they woke up, but they're not the people to leave us. So one thing I'd like to suggest is that we somehow clean the house. Um, and the other thing is that I just want to say the Atlantic Charter was, um, not about how do we get rid of the Nazis. It was about what do we do once they're gone and how do we get here. So we need to think ahead. Hopefully, you know, in August of 1941 was very dark days for you know, London and for the free world. But they were already thinking about Churchill and Roosevelt were already thinking about how do we get here? How do we end up with a master race once again that wants to take over the world? So we need to look at that. We need to fix what went wrong again, and that's what the Pacific Charter is supposed to be about. I, I think having a positive vision for the future is absolutely essential. Ronald Reagan, he uh, was a serious student of communism and a serious anti-communist. But he realized that you cannot fight communism solely with anti-communism. You have to have a positive alternative. You don't defeat Brand X on the grocery store marketplace by bad mouthing it. You defeat Brand X on the grocery store marketplace by having a better brand Y. And and uh, and so President Reagan delivered his Westminster speech, where he said that we should not shrink from articulating our goals. That what we really would like to see is a world of, of free, democratic, uh, representative governments. Uh, uh, with, uh, with rule of law and human rights and so on and so forth. And, and the, the, the 
concrete uh, action that came from that speech was the establishment of the National Endowment for Democracy and its four subsidiary organizations. And uh, you know whether we should be in the business of actively exporting democracy is, you know, there's some people for whom that is all quasi-religion, uh, but frankly, since I was one of the cooks in the kitchen uh, helping to create that, I believe it is actually a matter of, of uh, prudential judgment that, you know, in some cases, when uh, a given country has established a certain kind of form of government, uh, and it's taken them decades or centuries to try to settle into this, and, and there is an enormous amount of custom, Therefore, implicit legitimacy uh, according to that government. Uh, that maybe you don't try if it's a, a monarchy or something like that. You don't try to just try to make it overthrow the, the traditions of that society uh, with the democratic revolution. Uh, and and as, our, as, as our founders wrote in the Declaration of Independence, you do this only when the tyranny becomes absolutely intolerable. The, the Declaration of Independence was not a manifesto against any kind of monarchy. And so, uh, you know, there were concrete, positive things to be done, and I think that your articulation of how we need to have this positive alternative vision is absolutely essential. And we need to be standing up for human rights. I mean, you know, there are, I, I, uh, I'm in touch with a lot of the top sinologists in this country, and I'm, you know, I can't be. I, I have another job to do. I, I've been paying attention to China for 20 years, and, uh, but I, Maybe even longer, but uh, you know there are serious sinologists in this country who are calling it now in light of what's going on in East Turkestan. Uh, they're, they're calling it the Third Reich with Chinese characteristics, and it's not a joke. It's not a joke. So uh, you know we, we we need to see the world realistically, not the way we wish it to be. And uh, but we need to have a positive vision, and we need to be. You look at the organ forced organ transplant business. You can be a medical tourist, and you can go to China, and you can schedule the day on which you get a liver transplant because they will kill somebody to give you that liver. And this is just so grotesque and so monstrous. They have well over a hundred thousand liver, liver transplants that we can count a year. We have maximum maybe around five thousand. Uh, this is just unbelievable. Uh, but nobody knows about this. Knows about this. The, the, the human rights violations that are happening in China are, are, are monstrous. And we need to be holding them accountable for, for this. And we need to be siding with the people in China uh, in hopes that they can somehow secure for themselves a better future. I want to mention a couple of quick things. Um, I noticed that Dr. Lee Zhang is here, who had again, uh, the very issue that John was mentioning about the harvesting of uh, human organs and the, the murdering of political prisoners. Uh, this has been something you've been talking about for decades, and nobody paid attention. They, they were in denial, but now people are trying to recognize that. So I just wanted to cite it. She's one of the leaders who's bringing that up. But I'm so glad you mentioned that. A couple of quick things. Um, initiatives for China, I encourage you all to get involved in joining, getting on your website um, and showing support for the people of Hong Kong. Uh, John Fox sent me the link to their national anthem. The, Hong, the people of Hong Kong have their own national anthem, which I think is amazing and wonderful. Um, also, Institute of World Politics, there are some brochures on the table for those of you who might want to take John up on his offer to uh, to go to attend the, the school special on the counter, um, ca uh, what's, it, counter what's the title of it? Counterintelligence. The Counterintelligence. So we, have the intelligence. we have five degree, five masters. Five masters degrees. And a doctoral program in national security. And a doctoral program in national security. So the brochures are back there. Thank you all for coming and hearing this outstanding talk. And especially thank you to you, John. Thank you.